the best first step is putting on a show. So what I always tell people who want to be a producer and don't know where to start is put on a play for 10 people in like your living room and serve pizza and charge zero dollars and see how you put the pieces together with as low stakes as possible. Hello, and welcome to the Creative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. In the show, my guests and I explore how we can use creativity to do our best work and live our best lives. I talk with authors, musicians, actors, scientists, and others who are all pushing the envelope to live fully, creatively, and authentically. Listen in to get the scoop on how you can do it too. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Creative Mindset Podcast. My name is Isolde Trachtenberg, and I am so happy that you're here. And I'm really happy to introduce you to today's guest and also to meet today's guest because we've just figured out we probably have a lot of people in common. So let me tell you about Jennifer Ashley Tepper. She's the producer of the musicals Be More Chill, Broadway Bounty Hunter, and Love in Hate Nation. Her recent projects, these are they're part of a decade-long co collaboration with a group known as Joe Iconis and Family. She's also the creative and programming director at uh, Feinstein's 54 below, which is sort of like Broadway's living room. It's really a fabulous place. She's co-creator of the Bistro award-winning concert series celebrating underappreciated musicals called If It Only Even Runs a Minute, which I just, what a great title. And she's the conceiver and director of the Jonathan, Jonathan Larson Project. Her other Broadway credits include title of show, The Performers, Godspell, Macbeth, and The Parisian Woman. As a writer, and this is another super cool thing about her. I can't wait to talk about this. Tepper has authored three volumes of the Untold Stories of Broadway book series. I mean, come on, how fabulous is she? Jennifer, I wanna welcome you to the show. Thank you so much for having me and for the lovely introduction. Oh my goodness. I, I, I'm i like, you're, you know, you're now, now, now that I, now that I know more about you, quite frankly, because I didn't know about you before a few days ago, I'm your new number one fan. I have now elbowed aside whoever was number one <laughs> and I'm sitting, sitting in the front row. So I'm so excited that you're here. We, we know we have people in common, which I'm also, uh, I'm looking forward to chatting about that, but I want to talk to you. Let's start right off. You've produced multiple shows. You've worked on others on and off Broadway. You're the creative programming lead at Fine Scenes 54 Below. You've gotten a ton of experience in the theater world. My first question is, how did you start? What ignited your interest in, in performing and in theater specifically? I grew up uh, in Boca Raton, Florida, so pretty far away from New York City. And uh, I never had any family who worked in the theater, but I was lucky in that my parents and grandparents really loved the theater. So I was taken to local productions and I was enrolled in theater camp at a young age. Um, and I just loved it. I loved everything about it, but I especially loved learning about the shows. And, um, you know, I would see a touring production of A Chorus Line and be like, what else did those guys write when I was like nine? So wow. from a very young age, I was super interested interested in studying theater. And especially, I think, because I didn't have access to New York or Broadway, I put on my historian cap at a young age of going, okay, I can't, you know, go to Broadway, but I can get a cast recording at the mall and I can learn about the show. So that definitely sparked my interest at a young age. Wow. So when you were, when you were in that space and you were learning about the history of theater, what was, what was your favorite? What was the, what was the thing that made you go? And then I want to know more. And then I want to know more. Was it, was it Broadway shows? Was it theater productions? Was it the, like, cause I'm, I'm curious about the difference between, and perhaps you'll be able to enlighten me between something like dramaturgy and theater history. That's a great question because I think so many people uh, think that it's the same thing and it's of course not. Uh, I was so taken by, I think honestly, the writing and musicals and from the first time I heard something like Annie, which told a story and integrated, uh, you know, dance and character and, you know, song, all of the elements of a musical, I couldn't have defined it that way at a time, but something about the combination of elements just really moved me. And then I wanted to learn more about, again, like what those writers wrote and what those actors did and 
um, just p piece it together myself. I remember, you know, before I'd ever even been to New York, my mom used to let me order Playbill magazine. So I would literally get the Playbill in the mail with all the articles, um, you know, that come with your Playbill when you see a show without actually having seen them. I was just <laughs> fascinated. Um, and, you know, a huge part of what has also turned me in, into a historian was at that age, I was like, okay, I want to learn about the Broadway theaters themselves so I can picture what seeing these shows was like. And then when I got to New York, you know, I would go see a show in a theater I'd never been in and I would know, hey, these 10 Broadway shows played here before that. So I think that also, um, you know, definitely influenced my brain as I was growing up. Wow. So it, that's fascinating that that the actual buildings, the theaters themselves play such an active role in your imagination when you were 9, 10, 11 years old. That's so fabulous. And you mentioned playbills and I love I love playbills and I now have a love-hate relationship with playbills. I don't I don't know if you're old enough to remember back in the dawn of time in the 70s and 80s when I first started going to Broadway shows, one of the things playbills had was director's notes of the show you were seeing. And I so miss that because I love getting that insight about what a director sort of envisioned for the show that they were putting on. And I was wondering from you Within that, when you produce a show, when you're actually helping one happen, do you have a vision for the show or is that more of the director's purview? Um, you know, it totally depends on the individual project. I think that each musical is in itself like just a complete new creation. It's why musicals are so hard to predict as far as like what will work or what will run. Um, is it, it just depends. You know, I've worked on shows as a producer where, um, you know, similar to something that you just brought up where we've all thought about what kind of notes should be in the program to influence the audience before they see the performance or you know what shouldn't we put in the program because we want it to be discovered in performance certainly i've never worked on anything as a producer where i haven't been incredibly actively involved with the director and writer to shape the show um but you know it's always a combination of um artistic brains and sometimes there are certain elements you'll want to have input on on a production and on another production you might go oh that is completely the scenic designer's purview. So it just always alchemy every single time. That's lovely. I love the I love the idea of alchemy because it does seem like there are so many different parts that all have to work together in concert to make a show go up. But for what you do, and 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 it's funny to say that because I know you do so many different things, but as a producer, what does a producer do? What what is involved in in the producer's job for putting on a show? It's a great question because also, um, you know, there's so many producers that do completely different jobs. It's not like, you know, if you're a waiter at an Italian restaurant or you're a waiter at, you know, a Chinese restaurant, your job essentially has the same bones. And that's not true of producing. It's true of a lot of other jobs in the universe. But, um, you know, it's I, I think what I do at 54 Below as creative and programming director is producing. And that involves completely different tasks than producing a Broadway show like Be More Chill. Um, so, for example, on Be More Chill, you know, it's the producer's job to oversee every element of the production from raising the money and managing the investments to casting to the design to the writing to the marketing to like you know the day-to-day -day hiring and uh, budgeting uh it's everything it's really like you're the ceo and it's a company um and then something like 54 below which i'm you know running on a day-to-day -day basis is so different in that um you know that it has a structured business model and it's my job to uh basically program everything that gets on to our stage and make the decisions about how, um, you know, the artistic elements balance with the tech elements, balance with the budget elements, but it's not, um, the actual day to day is so different than a show, which is the same every night because 54 Below has three different shows with three different casts of personnel every night. So um, yeah, and producing can be line producing where it, it's just, there's so many different definitions. And I think that's part of why people don't really know what a producer does. That's why I actually wanted to ask the question because I know that people, well, a producer produces. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> that's that's one of those questions where you're, I I get stuck. I I've helped mount productions certainly, and I've directed productions, but I don't have a. Uh, to this day, I don't really have an idea, a really intimate idea of what a producer actually does. But something that you just said really it struck a chord with me. You put on three different shows with three different casts every night at 54 Below. What, what is entailed in that? How do you make that happen? 
Yeah, you know, I've been there for about six years now, and we typically have 18 shows a week. So some nights we have two shows, some nights we have three, and it depends on anything else going on in the space, like a special event or rental and other um, logistics. But essentially, you know, 54 Below's programming has evolved so that it includes uh, Broadway artists from like stars to people that are just starting out doing solo concerts and also musicals in concert and concerts that um, celebrate a certain songwriter, whether it's literally Irving Berlin or the Spice Girls. So it, <laughs> I love it. Uh, a, like, you know, a summary of the like variety, but it goes so far beyond that. Um, you know, I could list like 40 different genres of show. And so um, on any given night, you know, you have those three different shows in the building and you're figuring out which audience is going to come to each show and how that impacts which time each show gets and what the ticket price is and how much you can pay the artist. So um, all of those things are not things that would come into play on a Broadway show. You know, it's so, so different, as I mentioned. Um, and so 54 Below is really its own unique animal. And in order to run successfully, all of those different types of shows have to be programmed correctly and also do well enough. So it's an interesting <laughs> project. Oh, it sounds fascinating and also something that it would make me tear my hair out. But it, <laughs> budgeting in general makes me want to run screaming for the trees. So so that, I'm so glad that there are people like you who, who can do that and do it well. So let me ask you something. When you're, when you're setting up, a, I, I don't know if it's a season or if it's just year round. Do you have themes like, oh, for the next month, we're going to have, we're going to, you know, feature musicals or for the next month, we're going to feature the variety arts or anything like that. Do you do that? Or is it more of a, depending on, on, on who pitches to you or, or submits, hey, why don't we have this? How do you decide and how do you plan out your, uh, your months or your seasons at 54 Below? You know, it's definitely been wonderful when I've been able to theme some series, and we certainly have a lot of series that play regularly. Um, overall, it doesn't happen too often. Um, I was able to do a series of new musicals in concert a couple years ago where um, I really hands-on produced these 10 uh, weeks of once a week we had a new musical in concert that had never played New York but it had a significant production out of town or a workshop um, and you know was a worthwhile piece that deserved to see be seen in New York and among the shows that were in that series were Be More Chill which ended up going to Broadway and A Strange Loop which ended up winning the Pulitzer and yeah. all these new musicals that have had these extraordinary paths um, since then. Uh, and anytime we've done that, it's been really exciting. You know, I try during the summer to program a series. This summer, we were supposed to have um, a series of like new writers in concert, which is a little different than new musicals because it's usually writers presenting a variety of their work. But we've also had a duo show series during the summer, basically during times that are a little less um, audience friendly and might struggle a little bit more. We try to come up with a theme. But overall, um, because there's so much to fill and so much of it's dependent on artist schedules, a lot of the time it's just you know slotting in the best stuff for each time and even in that there's it sounds like there's so much to keep track of uh, let me ask you that within within either at 54 below or when you're mounting a show on broadway or off broadway what are the steps in the process of mounting a show what do you what do you do and what are the steps that 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 the show has to go through? If you could detail those, I would love it because it's something that I don't realize, I don't think a lot of people realize just how much goes into putting up a production. Totally. And you know, you hit the nail on the head with something you just said, which is that it's not possible to do all of it because there's so much. And so such an essential part of producing, whether, you know, at the 54 below level or at the theater Broadway level uh, is surrounding yourself with the best team possible and creating a group of collaborators that can really work together. Um, and that doesn't mean never disagreeing and that doesn't mean never fighting about an artistic decision. It just means like you're staffed in a way that you know you have people you can depend on to do the best job that they can. Um, and so, you know, with 54 below, so much of it is, you know, as mentioned, there are 18 shows a week. I'm putting that together, but I'm not producing hands on, obviously, each of the shows. And so, Luckily, we have um, a number of really wonderful concert producers who, you know, might come to me with an idea or I go to them with an idea and we say, okay, here are all the pieces. We want to do like an evening celebrating the musicals of Nymph and, um, you know, Nymph just ended. So how can we honor those shows that played that festival? Um, and maybe we can include this and maybe this date will make sense and this ticket price and these kinds of artists. And then I'm like, here are all the things you need go. And you trust somebody to, you know, go and run with that kind of idea that you've set up. Um, but they have the 
full authority to do it under their terms. So a lot of the times it's, you know, trusting people and delegating in that way. Um, and it's similar with that is something that there are parallels in a theatrical production or Broadway, you know, you, you can't be everywhere at once. So at some point, you know, you say, this is the direction I think that this kind of radio marketing should go in. And the person who's in charge of radio buys on your marketing team has that directive from you and runs with the radio buys. Um, it's really like your job as the producer to be captain of the ship and be able to delegate. And when you're delegating in this, in this way, whether at 54 below or, or a show, there, there are many elements that are the same, whether or not it's a school production or a, you know, a huge Broadway show, casting, directing, set and costume design, learning parts, blocking, etc. I know that you just said that you have a collab, sort of a collaborative effort going on in order to put this on. But as a CEO, as you put it, how do you usher all of these things along as a producer? Do you check in with casting directors? Do you check in with set designers? Do you oversee them? How does that process flow? You know, a huge part of it has to do with understanding what everybody's job is so that you can be the best possible support system for them to do their own job. So what's interesting is in writing my books, The Untold Stories of Broadway, um, I've interviewed about 300 theater professionals of all different kinds from, you know, house managers to ushers to directors to sound designers. And it's like, wow that I've had with a sound designer, um, you know, about their work on a musical in the 90s has helped my understanding of what a sound designer does in a way that when I'm producing a show, which is a completely different job, I go, okay, this is what the sound designer is trying to accomplish at this step of the process. And I can help them by doing X or I can help them by not worrying about this because this is what they need to do right now. So, so much of it is just understanding what jobs are and that, you know, trickles down to every element of what theater is. You know, you can't be a good producer if you don't understand what the merchandise team is doing or, you know, what the costume wardrobe team is doing. So it's it's just about understanding and a lot of times like theater is stressful because it takes a lot of time for things to come together you know you're in rehearsal and you're in tech and you're in previews and being able to understand what's just a part of the process and has to be a mess before it comes together and what you actually need to be fixing actively as a producer is a huge part of it and that's fascinating to me because it seems like what you just said and correct me if i'm wrong the other word in addition to collaboration is trust it feels like you need to trust yourself to know what you need to do and you need to trust the team, whether it's a set designer or somebody who's going to be running lights, that they know, that they know what they're going to need to do. How much of that do you have intrinsically and how much of that do you build? Do you ever spend time sort of working with the team to build a sense of trust or, or do you just accept everyone's going to be a professional? Absolutely. You know, that's a great question, too, because it the trust is so important and you do have to build it. And it's one of the reasons why, um, you know, theater is often better when there's some kind of foundation of creation among at least some of the people who are making the thing. Um, you know, we experienced that in a pretty extraordinary and unique way with Be More Chill because so much of us had been working on the show and, you know, with each other on other projects like in basements and barns for years. And so... <laughs> We got in a room for the first day of like a Broadway rehearsal process, there was a shorthand and an ability to trust that, um, you know, trickled throughout the whole team, including all of the new collaborators and created like a situation where, you know, we knew that something would come along in a certain way because we had that initial, you know, conversation two years before. So, um, yeah, no, I think that building that trust is essential. It doesn't mean that you have to have worked with people before, but it certainly does help. And it's why um, shows that are crafted, like, you know, for example, like the the 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee was similarly created like in a very small production in a cafeteria in the Berkshires. And so when those actors come to create on Broadway, they do have that trust. It's a huge part of um, what makes a lot of theater kind of come together is if you are able to build that in certain ways with members of the team. Sure. And that idea of building it together and knowing that you've done it together, I'm sure helps coalesce everyone. It helps everyone be cohesive as, as part of putting a show up. I, I, I remember doing productions in college and in high school and whatever needed to be done, you, you did, you know, <laughs> it didn't matter if you were, if you were the lead in the show, it didn't, what, it didn't matter, whatever needed doing, you were, you know, if you saw that it needed doing, you did it. And so now for you, uh, you know, you've worked on shows, directing, producing, marketing capacities, title of show, Godspell, Macbeth. Can, can you describe how, because I know that this is this sounds like a, a strange question, but it 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 isn't 
in that I, I too have many fingers and many pies, you don't do one thing. You do a number of different things. And I'm wondering, how did you for this career that's so varied, yet seems to be so intrinsic to who you are? You know, so much of it was that um, when I was growing up, there were certain people that I read about in books that I saw were doing kind of theater jobs and had careers that didn't fit like one specific path. And, um, you know, there was Ted Chapin, who's still one of my heroes, and Ira Weitzman, who's still one of my heroes. And there would sometimes be people that would poke out of a book and I would be like, okay, that person's not, you know, a writer or a costume designer or something that's easily defined. They're basically forging their own path. And it kind of integrated with both of those people I named, you know, their paths integrated the history and like making new musicals happen. So um, I had that idea in my head. Um, I don't know, again, if it would have been, I, I would have as deliberately been able to say it. Um, but for me, when I went to school at NYU, so much of what I learned during that time was that like, I would have to create my own opportunities. And I wasn't able to learn such specific things I wanted to know from class. So I had to assign myself books and like go to shows and take notes on changes being made and seek out internships and kind of craft my own education. And then I just did my best to continue that after I graduated um, and figure out how to, you know, in my first years in the professional world, integrate day jobs and, um, you know, paying rent with like learning from different opportunities that span theater history and theater producing. Um, And so much of it is just like following your passion and figuring out ways to make that work and then turning that into, you know, the best career possible. And it sounds like you're thriving. I mean, you know, the the creative projects that you're taking on and that you have taken on are fabulous and they're so much fun. And, and so I'm wondering when you're doing it, like, for example, I directed one show in college, okay? I, I was an English drama major, but I directed one show. And I remember the thrill of seeing my vision come to life. You know, it lives inside your head, you live it, you eat it, you breathe it for months, and then you can finally see it come together. And to me, that's magic. What's that process like for you? Do you stress about it? Do you stay zen? What's the magic for you in seeing one of your productions go up? You know, I what you just said made me think about the Jonathan Larson project, which was like a huge part of my life for years and still it is because that was such a process of crafting something as a director and as a conceiver that I then got to fully realize on a stage in a, you know, initial concert production. Um, but I think that, you know, stressing about stuff is okay. That just means that you care about it. It's using that stress to do something productive. That's really the key to it. And I think, um, you know, if you really are working on something and have that vision, vision for it. Um, Seeing that vision through often is accompanied by, you know, trouble in putting the pieces together and making sure that everyone is seeing the same thing you are. Um, With the Jonathan Larson project, you know, I spent years researching his unheard songs at the Library of Congress and really diving into every single part of, um, you know, his work that he left behind in order to craft the best possible song cycle of, um, you know, some, a kind of song cycle that he would have created um, that he never did as like a new musical theater writer. So unfortunately, Unfortunately, you know, we lost him uh, many years ago, so I wasn't able to, you know, collaborate with the living artist. So how do you carry on that person's vision through his legacy? Uh, And in doing that, I was so lucky to work with truly like my dream team of collaborators on the music team and on stage as actors and um, all over the place. But it definitely, um, you know, it it takes time to make people understand something that you've spent a lot more time with. So a lot of the process was bringing people into that. Um, And actually, it, it wasn't stressful in the way that some productions are because everybody really did have this was on the same page about wanting to learn about him um but it certainly was something that i felt like i stepped in the door first and had to figure out the right ways to bring each person on the team inside and it's it's interesting because within that you developed a team and it sounds like everybody loved his work in addition to wanting to be involved in the project is that the case or did you find people who didn't really know his work and actually let me just so Jonathan Larson wrote Rent. <laughs> For anybody who doesn't know who Jonathan Larson, if you're listening and you don't know who Jonathan Larson was, he wrote Rent, he wrote Tick, Tick, Boom, which is another musical I want to talk about and uh, with you, Jennifer. So, so just so you know, but, but with, with, uh, as far as you people who are listening to this, Jonathan Larson wrote Rent. And if you don't know what Rent is, go find it, either a production or rent the movie, go find it. Anyway, so, so, um, were they people who already knew his work or did you have to introduce them to uh, to Rent or who, who may have not known what this was going to be and you had to pitch them on it? How did that happen? 
You know, there was sort of a range of knowledge. Uh, there are five actors who are in the show. And, um, you know, the actors, uh, Andy Mantis and Nick Lehmeyer, who were two of the five actors, like they're huge Jonathan Larson nerds. And, you know, as you mentioned, Jonathan Larson, he wrote Rent, but, uh, you know, that he died when he was 35, right on the cusp of Rent happening um, in 1996. And he died very unexpectedly and tragically. And so, um, you know, his show lived on and it created this kind of new generation of theater writers and actors who were so influenced by it. And, you know, you can see Rent in every single piece that's come out from three years after Rent happened to like now, um, you know, it's been so influential to a generation. And so Nick and Andy were as nerdy as I was and are, were always <laughs> popping up with like different facts of like, oh my God, did you know that on track seven of Rent, he does this chord and that's weird. And that like, they were on the nerd page with me. And then George Salazar, who was also in the show, had done Tick, Tick, Boom with Nick and knew Jonathan so well through that, but did not know Rent as well. And then um, Chris Rodriguez and Lauren Marcus were definitely in the middle of that. So with the actors, it was an interesting thing of people came to it with different perceptions of Jonathan's work. And um, that was actually really helpful. And then Charlie Rosen, who's the musical genius behind uh, creating, you know, a lot of the songs were demos that were Jonathan Larson and a piano uh, in the 80s in his apartment that no one had heard. And Charlie took all these demos with me. And what we tried to do was create the kind of song from them and the kind of arrangement that Jonathan would have conceived had he gotten to fully orchestrate it. So we weren't like taking a Jonathan Larson pop rock song and turning it into a jazz song. We were more looking at a song and going, oh, Jonathan was clearly influenced here by like Billy Joel and by Into the Woods. And, you know, taking the elements that were influencing him and turning that into a song with instruments and arrangements and actors. Um, so, and Charlie, you know, was not as familiar until we started working on it. So it was, it was like a big uh, melting pot of people who came to it with different perceptions of Jonathan's work and who, um, you know, had conversations together to try to create a new show of his work. Wow. And and what happened to the show? Like you produced the show. What what What's next for it? Is there something next? Is there something in the hopper for it? Yeah, uh, so the show happened uh, at the end of 2018, and it was wild because it happened right in between Be More Chill off Broadway and on Broadway, and half of the people involved also were doing Be More Chill together. So <laughs> it was a very, very heady time, but we were so, so lucky in that uh, Ghostlight Records uh, and Kurt Deutsch had us do a cast recording. So we were able to capture it um, on an album, and the album, you know, 54 Below's week of performances were so magical, and there was something in the air that, you know, people were telling me all the time like I've never felt anything like this in the room so I'm so grateful people got to experience it live during the concert premiere but we were also equally lucky to have this album go out in the world so like thousands of people have heard these songs that had never been heard before and that could not actually come to 54 Below and we've been able to put out a lot of content online um, and as far as the future of it you know we're actively working on the next uh, step forward on stage so uh, you know we did that concert premiere to see what the bones were and now it's like how are we gonna put that on a stage in a theater and hopefully have a way so that after that happens that um, productions can happen everywhere and sheet music can get released and this can um, you know, be sent out into the world in an even bigger way. Wow, that's so exciting. That's amazing. And it's, it's great that it, it's gonna keep growing, you know, that, that, that certainly his talent remains alive as, as long as people are singing and listening to his songs, which, which I think is, you know, to me anyway, part of, part of, the, part of the result of, of putting the, this production together. And, and you mentioned Krista Rodriguez, and this brings up the tie-in. We were, we were chatting before we started recording the show that we know people in common, and it's so funny because Krista Rodriguez originated Wednesday Adams in the Adams Family musical. The music and lyrics were written by my, my high school leading man, Andrew Lippa. So, <laughs> so it's great. Yeah, Andrew and I did all of our high school shows together, with the exception of the very first one that I ever did, it was the Fantastics, and Andrew was El Gallo, I was Bellamy, and Jeffrey Seller, producer of Hamilton and Rent and In the Heights and you name it, uh, Avenue Q, uh, and he was Huckleby. So I I got to play in the in the same show with with uh, I, I like to say that I knew Jeffrey back when he was Jeff, and that's the uh, that's the <laughs> that's my claim to fame. But but yeah, so so what is your what is your connection to 
Jeff and Andrew and or Jeffrey, I should say, and Andrew now, do you collaborate with them? How does that flow happen for you? And how do you collaborate with people when you're st- when you're starting to run a show? How do you develop and forge those relationships? You know, I think one of the luckiest things for me in my career so far is that I've been able to have the opportunity to really come up together with my peers and to work with people, um, you know, when they were first starting out, just like I was and see them, you know, as you mentioned, similar to what you've experienced, like blossom into different um, kinds of artists and have these extraordinary opportunities. So, you know, Krista is someone who <clears throat> I worked with 10 years ago um, and who, you know, we collaborated on a lot of Joe Iconis' concerts and projects like that together and um, getting to see her and so many other people in that group realize even further you know opportunities has been so great and then with people like Andrew and Jeffrey who um you know I grew up listening to their work or really like worshiping their producing um it's been so exciting to get to collaborate with people like that at 54 Below and on my books and on theater projects um and go like oh I'm working hand in hand with these people who I once really looked up to so with Jeffrey it's interesting because my actual first professional job was as um the intern on title of show which then turned into being the director's assistant on title of show when it moved to Broadway so right when I was a senior in college and then the year after I graduated I spent a lot of time in Jeffrey Seller and Kevin McCollum's producer office um, <laughs> while you know in the heights was going on and rent was going on and title of show was going on and so getting to be amidst that um for that kind of pivotal year was really exciting um and you know I was so honored like Jeffrey came to see the Jonathan Larson project and was so lovely and talking about Jonathan and I've definitely read a lot of their correspondence from before either of them you know hit so to speak so mm-hmm. it's always exciting to kind of work with people at different levels in that way Oh, that sounds what a what a ripe time to to jump into living your dream. That's so wonderful. Let me ask you though, what would you say to someone who wants to be, you know, they're about to graduate from high school or college and they want to become a producer? What's the best first step? How how would someone just getting started begin? Not maybe 10 years ago, but today. What do you think is the best step for someone who wants this as a career? You know, the best first step is like putting on a show. So what I always tell people who like want to be a producer and don't know where to start is like put on a play for 10 people in like your living room and serve pizza and charge zero dollars and like see how you put the pieces together with as low stakes as possible. And then the next time you do it, you know, it'll be in a rehearsal studio and you'll charge $10 and then the next time and the next time. So it's just a matter of getting started and not being intimidated by step 20 when really you just need to start with step one and find the people that you want to collaborate with and find the show you want to do and figure out how you're going to be a producer and fit the pieces together. Um, But that said, you know, my advice in this exact moment, you know, is probably different from that advice because as opposed to, you know, six months ago or hopefully six months from now when that'll be good advice. Right now, we obviously can't gather a bunch of people to eat pizza and do a reading. So, so much of the best advice right now in this exact moment, I would say has to do with educating yourself and um, anyone in the business, but especially a producer. As I said, one of the best ways to arm yourself is by understanding all the different jobs in the theater. Um, And that's why, you know, like we chatted about, I've been reading so many books during quarantine because I feel like equipped being like able to be equipped with knowledge is some of the best, like, you know, one of the best things we can do right now so that we're prepared for what's next in the theater. Um, so like an aspiring producer who's able to read a book about like a producer from the fifties or the way that theater worked in the thirties or the way that, you know, someone talked about doing a show yesterday and wrote a book about it. Like all of that is going to be so helpful for a future producer. That's fabulous. And, and you mentioned, and I love this idea during the quarantine, which is where we are now, you have set yourself a goal to read a hundred books. First of all, where are you in that goal? Because it's a fabulous goal. And what are you reading right now? I have read about 45 books so far. Um, so hopefully we'll get to that hundred book goal. Um, but what's interesting is like some of the books are really, I think, it's clear how they would be constructive. I just finished reading a book about uh, Ziegfeld uh, by Ethan Morden, which was fascinating. And it actually took a while to read because on every page I was like, oh my God, I want to know more about that. And so I started doing some research. And as soon as you start like looking into another time that seems so remote and so different from what we're living, you discover that there are all of these similarities and things that they did that could be tried in a new way now. Um, It just, it like blows my mind how I'll be like, oh, in the 1890s, they tried advertising 
advertising in this way and how would we do that now and nobody's doing that now and would it work so it's so wonderful to have books kind of spark those revelations right now um but that said you know some of the books i'm reading are novels that seemingly have nothing to do with the theater but i feel like as long as your brain is working to digest information and words like you never know how it's going to positively impact you um and i've also been doing some writing and doing other things but i found that focusing on reading at times has really helped me um find something constructive to do right now I love that. I love, I mean, as we were chatting about reading earlier and what you just said really sparked something in me because it sounds to me like you have an insatiable curiosity and, and a, oh, I wonder what this is. Oh, wait, what about that? What do you think accounts for that? Because curiosity to me is one of the most important qualities we can strive to possess. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on curiosity and what it means to you to be a curious person. I think honestly diversifying your interests is a big part of it because you know the year that I produced a Broadway show and an off-Broadway show and a show out of town I wasn't reading at all and like I love reading and I love it for all the reasons I just stated and during that year I was so completely consumed with producing on stage and 54 Below that I wasn't really able to do it and so then when I returned to reading um I was you know so much more curious because I had taken that break and I find that that's true on a micro level as well like a huge thing that feeds my ability to be like, okay, I'm programming 18 shows is that, you know, yesterday I was doing something totally different, interviewing people for my book. It's the way that, um, you know, if you're doing one thing all the time, I think it's harder to remain curious about it. And if you're attacking things from such different angles of like, it's all theater related, but some of it's history, some of it's the present, some of it's producing, some is writing, um, you're able to put on different hats within that and they feed each other. And that idea of, I, 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 it, to me, it's it's sort of, it, it exit on, you know, oh, and it leads to the next question and it might lead to the next question. And I love that aspect of being curious and also f- sort of feeding that hunger to know more, which I think is great. And, and I would love to, if you don't mind, switch gears a little bit and talk about your writing because it sounds to me like you were curious about what you started writing about and that's what got you going because you, you're telling the untold stories of Broadway and you've had I think three volumes already and tell me what is the series about and what inspired you to write these stories? Uh, the Untold Stories of Broadway is basically, um, you know, it's a series of books about the Broadway theaters themselves that use people's personal stories and my own discoveries to tell those stories and really bring the theaters to life. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, I've interviewed like 300 theater professionals in all different fields. Um, and then the kind of way that the books are created is wrapping that around the specific theaters that each stories took place in. So, um, you know, there's a chapter about the Richard Rogers Theater that talks you know, from the perspective of someone who did 1776 there in 1969. And then you're hearing from someone who did, you know, in the Heights in 2008. And both of those stories take place in the orchestra pit. And so how do the physical spaces impact the way that art is created and the way that it lives on and the way that, you know, we occupy these spaces that have been so important to history. So, um, you know, the books definitely stem from, you know, as I mentioned, like my fascination from afar with the theaters themselves, since I wasn't able to actually be inside of them. And then when I got to New York and started really learning about how different the theaters are from each other and how the real estate impacts the art and how the history of like lost theaters and theaters that we currently have impacts Broadway as an art form. Um, It all really interested me. Um, And during my first time working on Broadway on Title of Show, I spent so much time at the Lyceum thinking about people that had been there before and how they'd occupied the space. And that was a huge part of my inspiration for the books, which um, I always imagined that I would write at some point, but ended up happening, you know, when I was fairly young, like in 2013, when I started writing them, I really feel like even, you know, seven years later, I'll look back on the first book and go, oh, that's such a different perspective than one I would have now. So my own, it's like gonzo journalism, right? It's like I put myself in the center of it and was really a 26 year old experiencing it and writing about it and working on the fourth book, which I have done a good deal of writing, um, for during quarantine, it's such a different perspective to be writing about it as someone seven years older in the midst of this specific moment for the theater. Um, But I'm still writing about, you know, the same years of history that people worked in these theaters. It's such an interesting jump for me in that way. It's so interesting what you just said. It's like looking at a gem, but from different facets, you know, you're looking at the same thing, but from different perspectives as you grow as a, as a person who's involved in theater, but also as you grow as, as a person living 
today, we're in a very different time than we were even 10 years ago. Heck, even you know, six months ago. So it is so it is so different. And yet it sounds like it informs what you're writing. Does it does this sounds kind of like a strange question, but I'm gonna to have to ask it. Do the stories bounce back on you ever? In other words, you bring a different perspective to the story as you're writing it, but does the story ever inform as you do the research or as you do the interview, does the story inform your view on life and and on your profession? And if so, how? Definitely. You know, I think a huge part of it, um, separate from, you know, the whole learning more about sound design and that making me a better producer, that's a huge way that I think it does impact on a, you know, day-to-day -day basis. But I also think just hearing things from different perspectives and the way that doing this kind of project has allowed me to do, it really like makes you internalize the fact that there are usually almost never good guys and bad guys. It's not that clear in <laughs> in life, um, not just in the theater, but in any situation, you know, there's such a need, um, a human need to go, this is wrong and this person is wrong. And you really go, oh, you know, there's so many different ways to look at the scenario and like people need to try to understand each other's perspectives to actually solve anything constructively. And when you interview multiple people about the same show or the same theater or the same profession, you really start to see that, that nobody is wrong. That people just have these different ideas and how do you like negotiate those with each other. So I think that's been something that's reflected back on me a lot. Um, but also, you know, in actual concrete stories that people have told that have impacted this time, I found myself now, you know, editing and reading stories about theater during 9-11 or other moments of crisis and really seeing the parallels as to how um, theater continued and how people handled certain problems. So that's been interesting. And I also, you know, I, in writing the fourth book, I've come upon a lot of um, things that happen in certain theaters that I don't think I would write about in the same way if we weren't in the moment we were in. I discovered a show called The Medicine Show, which ran during the Great Depression and was um, very much about public health and started really researching that and um, writing a, a big section about that for the next book. And I don't know that that would have sparked my brain in the same way if we weren't living through what we're living through. And, and it's so interesting that the environment around you impacts not only how you write, but exactly what you end up choosing to write about. That's, that's really fascinating that, that, and I'm glad that you're able, um, you know, sort of to stay open to that, to, to being moved by something new. That's a lot of people I think uh, might have a harder time with that and, and have, you know, this is my vision and this is all I'm going to do. And it sounds to me like you are, again, that curiosity comes into play and, it's it's open and this idea of of history through the eyes of a theater really interests me i don't i don't know if you saw maybe you were in the audience that night i don't know but they did that thing at the richard rogers the hamilton cast sang something from a chorus line and then they brought up the original cast on the 40th anniversary of chorus line which i thought was just brilliant and that there was this touchstone of history that we were able to see then and now when you do this when you when you write these stories how much of that touchstone is is what's sparking you and how much of that touchstone are you trying to bring through to the reader you know it happens so naturally um it's really quite amazing how that has really happened in an authentic way in each chapter um you know I, it's interesting, the Golden Theater is in this next book, and the Golden Theater was the home of falsettos when falsettos first came to Broadway, which mm. was in the early 90s when uh, the AIDS crisis was in a different moment than it is now. And being able to interview people who were there for that and how audiences reacted to a show about the AIDS crisis is really chronicled in that chapter. And then in that same chapter about that same space, I got to interview people about the normal heart, which happened, um, you know, multiple years later and in a different decade when AIDS was considered a quite different kind of crisis. So being able to go, oh, these two shows both occupied the same place, both talked about the same, you know, crisis and virus and um, public health issues, but in the shows are totally different. The people are totally different. The year is totally different. And yet how does the energy of that space impact those pieces of art? So there's so many ways that you end up finding these little connections. Um, and it's interesting, you know, with a lot of these theaters, hundreds of productions have played them and there would be no way to talk about all those productions. So as you said, as a historian, you start to realize, oh, like how did authors write books that picked which shows to talk about and which shows got left out? And so a huge part of being a historian, 
um, you know, responsibly is going, oh, maybe even though such and such show ran less performances or, you know, was technically less well reviewed by critics, how do we integrate them into the story? Because they had, you know, six, you know, female members of the creative team, or they were addressing this topic that shows hadn't addressed yet, or, you know, all kinds of reasons why something might be worthy of being covered or, um, you know, being part of a history book. So you really start to think about why we're writing about what we're writing about in the history books as well, and how that impacts how theater continues. And that's interesting that you said that, because what, what that sparked in me is what you said about, you know, the show being worthy of, of having attention paid to it. And that brings me to the concert series. If it only even runs a minute, talk about that for a minute, because I think what a fabulous, fabulous thing to do and to decide that this is something that you want to bring to people's attention. What is, if it only even runs a minute <laughs> and what makes you, what made you, and it sounds like you've already answered that question, but I'm still going to ask it again. What made you decide that this was something you wanted to do? You know, underappreciated musicals were such a huge part of my DNA from the first moment I discovered theater because for me, again, like growing up in Florida, mainly with cast recordings as my point of entry, I would hear something like Merrily We Roll Along, which is still to this day my favorite musical. And to me, you know, that would be equal to something like Annie. They were both just an album that I had. They were both telling a story. They both, you know, had characters I was interested in and a, a story and plot I was interested in. And so for me, it didn't matter that Annie ran for years and was a huge hit and merrily roll along um, did not run for as long to me they were both just musicals so um, really getting to kind of discover shows from their recordings made me start everything on equal ground and then you go okay so like these shows that happen to not have as long runs in their initial productions um, it doesn't mean that they're not worthwhile and it doesn't mean that they shouldn't be done again in productions or explored in concerts and so that's really part of what inspired if it only runs a minute um, was going how do I make more people love these shows that I I love and that they might not have heard and gathering you know original cast members and writers and people to not only recreate performances and um, you know perform new renditions of songs but also to tell stories and to let people know like how these shows that um, might not have gotten a fair shake their first time around were just as worthy uh, it was just a huge passion project and I've been doing it for about 10 years and actually we had um, our first themed edition which was supposed to honor the musicals of Hal Prince who specifically you know was such a legend in our field because he created so many risky shows and as with any long career in the theater a lot of them were gigantic hits and a lot of them were not and so we were going to explore a lot of his shows that were you know really worthwhile and didn't run for as long and that unfortunately has been postponed although we will do it at some point but I think that the touchstone of musicals that are underappreciated has really helped um, you know my sense of creating new musicals evolve um, because you know basically there's so much to appreciate I mean honestly like cast recordings from underappreciated shows are among my favorites. Oh I love it I love it and Merrily Will Roll Along is I well I love the show and uh it's funny I saw uh, I was living in DC in the early 90s and there was a production with Victor Garber who I didn't actually know yet but I saw that it was at the arena stage I think and I saw that show and I was like this is great you know I love what a, yeah you you've got good taste I have to say so let me ask you a question what draws you to a show is it the music? Is it the book? What makes you go, ooh, this is awesome. I love it. You know, I think that a lot of it has to do with both feeling like I'm hearing a story that has not been told before and also in the craft of the way that the story is being told. And that sounds pretty, you know, basic bones. But, um, you know, with a lot of shows that I found myself responding to, it's really in the fact that, like, the lyrics for the songs could not be from any other show. They're very specific to those characters. And I think that's, you know, certainly like a hallmark of musicals in 2020 as opposed to musicals in 1930 or something. But um, for me, like, my favorite shows are really specific and often feel like um, stories about real people. I think that with shows like Merrily, which is like a favorite of mine and um, other favorites, I'm like, oh, those are actual human beings that even if they didn't exist, they could have existed. I tend to respond really well when it's a show that feels like um, real human beings. That's so interesting. My favorite show uh, it doesn't have any human beings in it. <laughs> <laughs> No. Uh, yeah, no, my, my favorite show is Wicked and they're all, you know, fairies or whatever. So, um, <laughs> or, or munchkins, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's so, it's so, I love that you said that, that it's, it, 
it's real people and their process. And I, what is it? I think Oklahoma was the first show that actually had songs that pertained to the story and were part of the story. And uh, did you see the the production that just closed, I think in January? Did you see that production? I did, it was remarkable. I think uh, that you know, it's something I've been thinking about it more during this time, but as far as like the history of the musical as we know it, you know, Showboat, which was 20 years before Oklahoma, um, was so important in terms of integrating the elements. And I've definitely been studying a lot during this time, the shows that came before even Showboat that started to integrate the elements and led to, you know, the art form as we know it today. Did you see that production? I did. Oh, I, I've I've fangirled all over Patrick Vale <laughs> since, since that, uh, I, since that, seeing that production he, he was wow was he brilliant i mean everybody the whole show was great i thought it was terrific but i just his judd fry blew me out of the water it was amazing um so yeah i saw i saw it and was just sorry i didn't get to see it more than once um so so let me let me ask you a question when you when you're in the process of this when you're in the process of doing research when you're in the process of the beginning beginning work on producing a show what is, what are your first steps what is the first thing you do do you get curious about it do you uh, do you have a vision for it what is the what is the very first step that you take when you begin a new project you know i think that like all of the projects I've worked on like most thoroughly have a different answer to that. Um, mm -hmm. So much of the time, the initial seeds come from before you're ever actively working on it. Like so many of the things we've just chatted about, I'm like, oh yeah, the seeds for my book were planted before I ever thought about, you know, writing that book or, oh, the seeds for a concert series about underappreciated musicals were planted, you know, years earlier when I was just learning about them. So I think so much of it just has to do with like staying curious, as you said. And the first step is often, um, you know, learning about something or really uh, responding to something that you're letting yourself experience without any pressure to create something from it and just seeing where that leads you. And I think that's like a good lesson for me to remember and for other people maybe during this time, which is like, there's a pressure for some people uh, to create and to like write something and to make a new thing. Um, but so much of what's gonna help create stuff is like incubating your interests. And whether that means watching movies or reading or just like learning about something, I think that the first step is often just like cultivating your natural excitement for what you want to make. Absolutely. And, and, you know, it's funny, I was, I was interviewing a, a mystery writer for the show last week and we were talking about writing and he said, you know, even when you're not writing, you're still writing. And I said, yeah, you're percolating. And he went, yes, that's exactly what's going on. And I think that's what happens. You, you need time for sort of your subconscious to bubble around and, and come up with, with the inspiration and with the focus and with the ideas. And if you're constantly writing, I don't think you're giving yourself enough time to, to percolate. So that's, that's lovely that you, that you honor that in, in your process and, and in sounds like in other people's process as well. So let me ask you, about your favorite shows that you've worked on. What made them your favorites and what are they? You know, I have spent like a lot of the last decade uh, collaborating with Joe Iconis, who's, you know, a musical theater writer who I work with all the time. And from my first moment collaborating with him when I was first entering the industry, I just thought like, oh, this person is writing musicals and characters and songs like nobody else is. Um, and I really responded to the fact that, you know, he was writing for today, but also um, integrating so many things that I love about like the classic elements of the musical. And so we worked together on, you know, so many shows and concerts and albums and so much of like the last year and a half of my life was spent with a lot of those things fully coming to fruition um, with you know finally getting a show to Broadway together and finally getting a show to off-Broadway together and um, you know so much of what like makes me passionate about his shows continually is all of those things when I first started out but also like the group of artists we've been able to bring together um, to you know create them like as a collaborative family and so we have this you know group of people called Joey Connors and family who we do concerts of 54 below and we do all kinds of projects together uh, and it's just grown over the years and certainly like a lot of the things I've been most passionate about have been created with that group. Oh, that sounds lovely. It's great to have collaborators that inspire you and that you can work together. And it's it's interesting to watch within that when you're collaborating. Um, what are you doing? This sounds kind of a strange question since nobody's hanging out together, but what are you doing together? How are you using technology, for example, to maintain those collaborative efforts? And and if you, if you are, I don't know if you are, but if you are, how are you doing that? How are you incorporating 
the pandemic and and technology to keep creativity going forward? You know, I've thought a lot about uh, the shutdown and the quarantine situation right now happening in 2020 is so different from what it would have been, um, you know, 20 years ago in terms of so many things, but in terms of like artists staying in touch and learning and creating, um, you know, there's so many resources that we have right now that wouldn't have been the case even 10 years ago. And so uh, we actually had an album come out of Broadway Bounty Hunter, which was a show that we all created off Broadway last year. And just being able to do pretty much everything we would do if we weren't in quarantine, in quarantine, um, you know, from having like a virtual listening party to editing the album together, to doing press and social media about it, you know, there's so much that happens on the internet um, and it's so much of how you reach your audience now that we were really able to collaborate in pretty much the same way. Um, you know, it would have been lovely to sit in a studio together and listen as opposed to listening at our computers, but at least we had the option to have that kind of fill-in, whereas it wouldn't have existed before. So um, I think that the te technology we have right now is pretty extraordinary to keep us connected and moving some things forward. I think it's so wonderful. Yeah, I agree with you completely. And it, it, it allows ingenuity in a different way as well as in sort of some of the same ways. Like, yeah, we don't have to all be in the studio together. We can be sitting on Zoom and, and, rec and recording and listening and, and giving feedback and all of that. And it's amazing to me that technology is allowing this. And I'm, I'm personally am super grateful or this podcast would not exist right now. So, so that's, that's a lot of what I find myself grateful for. But when you're talking about this idea of the state of theater during the quarantine, during the time when we're all sort of sheltering at home, what is the state of theater right now in your mind? How, how are things, where, where, where are they? Where, where is the theater Broadway or, or, you know, touring companies, all of that. What's happening? If you can give an opinion on that, I would love it. You know, I think that right now the bottom line is like, we're not creating theater and we won't be able to create theater until it's safe to do so. And until it's financially feasible to do so. And all of um, those elements will hopefully come together to build a new future, um, you know, as soon as we can. But for now, so much of what's happening, um, you know, all of the online content is, it's incredible that it exists and it's wonderful in so many ways, but it's not actually theater. And I think everybody does know that. Um, but that said, you know, theater Theater is about creating a song and putting it on the internet and having that influence the way you're writing your next show or reading a book that informs the next production you're doing. Like there's so many ways to stay active and creative and artistic, but I think all of it, um, you know, hopefully is being done with an aim as far as like what we actually do when theater can open up. And so, um, you know, I think every show and every like kind of creative um, is having all these conversations about how do we move forward. But the bottom line is that like nobody actually knows because so much of it depends on public health and the government. So, um, you know, the holding pattern can be really scary for artists, especially because of the whole like, how do we pay our rent with no industry? But honestly, I think that like, the way forward is just by continuing to ask questions and like figuring out how to stay active in your brain while we're actually not able to create theater. And it's exactly that. It's it, again, we're percolating. Everybody is either hibernating or percolating, but things are still happening. You know, inside you, if you're just, if you decide, I'm teaching, for example, a, a singing class every Friday, you can show up on my, on my Zoom live and I teach a singing class and I've got some people who are off-Broadway performers and people who are sort of folk musicians and various other people who want to, who want to keep their skills up, you know, you, they want to keep their chops. So they're, they're coming and they're, they're, we're, we're actually learning songs. And I think people are doing that. I think that idea of maintain and grow and you don't have, yes, we're not doing actual theater on a stage, but you can, you can keep building your skills. You can keep learning. And I think that's, fabulous for when it does open back up. I mean, you have to understand, I just, this almost a year ago now, in I almost literally June 1st last year, I, my husband and I picked up our lives and left DC and moved to New York because I finally was like, I have to live in New York. I have to be near New York theater. And, and so, and now of course, and he's like, how do you feel about the fact that there's no theater? And I'm like, oh, there's theater. It's just right now, it's a different part of theater that's going on. You know, there's, there's other things that are going on. People are writing. I think there's going to be a huge creative sort of burst once things open back up. What are your thoughts on that as far as when 
things are lifted and when it's safe to be outdoors and, and be together again. What do you think is going to happen to theater and the, the art form itself? Yeah, you know, I think that one of the main things we have to remember is like the best lesson in theater separate from the quarantine is being ready to meet the opportunity when it occurs. And, you know, in normal life, that means like honing your skills so that when the right audition happens, you have the right skill set and the right confidence to get that job. And I think that's applicable to right now as well, because whatever you're doing in quarantine, whether it's like writing a new musical or whether it's taking care of your mental health, you're doing the thing that's going to help you meet the opportunity when it's you know, open. Um, I think the weird thing about the specifics we're living with right now and reopening is like, yeah, I mean, there could very well be far more musicals or plays or pieces of art than there were a year ago because people have had the time to write it. But um, it's we shouldn't be discouraged if we don't see that happen right away as far as what's being created. Because the main thing is that like, the only way that theater gets made is by people giving money, whether it's for-profit theater or non-profit theater. And the way that the financial, you know, moment we're in right now is going to impact the amount of shows that are able to get put on. Um, and the way that the number of audience members who have disposable income and feel safe coming to the theater is going to be regrown, it's going to happen gradually. And there's going to be so much less, so many less, fewer shows when we reopen than there were when we closed. And that's probably going to be true for a while. And that doesn't mean that there wasn't an incredible, you know, creative ground well or that there's not a new era that has amazing um you know shows that are coming our way that do new things for the theater um but it, it's not going to happen immediately when things reopen because of the all of the circumstances so i think that um that'll be an interesting thing to see you know how that happens moving forward that's a really wonderful point and this idea of moving forward where do you see theater going after after the quarantine after all of this what are the possibilities for the art form as we move further into this century you know i mean they're honestly limitless like we there's no way of um really putting a limit on what we can do in a, a space where you're telling a story to other people you know live with other people next to you so um you know i i really i don't know that it's ever possible to predict in any moment i think a lot of people are going like oh you know will we see more um you know upbeat people want to just feel joy musicals like during the great depression and i always have to go no, you know, at the same time as that was a large part of the escapism that we associate with the Great Depression, the Great Depression had, um, you know, political musicals and it had um, all kinds of different types of art. So I think one of my favorite things about theater and about musical theater especially is like all of those things can exist simultaneously and um, it's not necessarily like a trend doesn't mean that that's the only kind of show that exists. So I think that, um, you know, we'll see so many different things and I, I sometimes predict and then I'm like, oh my God, I don't even, there's not even even possible to kind of see where we're going we're gonna to be 10 years from now. And, and that's likely true. I mean, there's so many things that we were just certain were going to happen that didn't. And so many things that have been such a surprise <laughs> as we've gone. And, and that's not just about theater. You know, time marches on, but it often has a lot of surprises along the way. So that I think is, that's a truism for the ages. So let me, let me ask you a quick, uh, another quick question. And I know I keep saying that just a few more questions, but. Yeah, oh, no, but <laughs> <laughs> so within within this idea of moving forward what would you say to young performers not so much producers or even directors but performers people who are listening to Hamilton or Wicked or some or Dear Evan Hansen or you know whatever show it is um it, it's funny because um one of my voice students before I left DC, her, she wanted to sing, they actually now, they wanted to sing uh, Michael in the Bathroom. And they were like, well, no one's going to know this show. And I'm like, yeah, but it's still a musical. And even if they don't know it, you should put it out there. And they're not necessarily going to become a performer, but boy, do they love musicals, right? They really, it's, it's, it's sparks them like crazy. So to encourage someone like that who just loves musicals and would want to perform in them maybe somehow, what would you say that they ought to do? You know, um, that's like 
I think been one of the most rewarding parts of writing my books is getting to connect with young people about all the different jobs that there are in theater separate from being on stage. Um, I always think it's so interesting that like you can't be the publicist for the high school play so people don't know that being a publicist is a thing you can do or you know you can't major in being an agent but agents are you know there's hundreds of them and they run Broadway so I think that just figuring out that there's other jobs and kind of trying to learn what those other jobs might be um, is a huge uh, moment and a special thing that you can do for yourself as someone interested in theater who might not find a career on the stage. Um, but I think also, you know, especially in the next couple years as the theater industry tries to rebuild and we find that there are less jobs, um, hopefully for a temporary period of time, I think the best advice for young people is like, a, don't be discouraged. Like this doesn't mean that you'll never have a job in theater. It's just what the moment is that we're living in right now. And B, like find other things that you love to do. And I don't mean that it has to be like a fallback career, which has, you know, a negative connotation, but, um, you know, survival jobs in New York are going to be just as hard to find as theater jobs for a, a while, um, with all of the restaurants that are closing and all of the, um, types of jobs that are, you know, going to have less people able to do them. So I think that finding skills and interests that you have that can help pay the rent while you pursue your interests and your skills in theater. Um, it's going to be such an important and essential part of the next few years as young people who enter, you know, the theater business try to figure out making a life for themselves. And that right there, this idea of a survival job, I think it's so important. And and we do have this, there's almost a stigma around it, but not in New York. You Many people have you know, they call them your day job, but it is, it's a survival job. It's the job you work just for anybody who's listening, who doesn't know what that is. It's a job you work while you're in the process of building whatever creative career you're going after. It might be on, you know, Broadway. It might be uh, as a painter. It might be as a musician. That part isn't as important as the fact that sometimes you're going to have to pay the rent and that, well, actually you're always monthly, you're going to have to pay the rent and you might live with 15 roommates, but you still are going to have to come up with your share of the bedroom that you share with five people. So as, yeah. as you're, as you're growing, you know, as you're, as you're moving along. So you've answered the question beautifully for young performers, but what about older people? I, I the, the actor, John Mahoney, I think started when he was 56 years old or something like that. And Rodney Dangerfield also started very sort of late comparatively speaking. And there, there are lots of people I think right now during this shutdown who are really thinking about, well, I, I'm so much like, yes, money is tight, but I'm so much happier not having to go to this job that I don't really like. And what I really want to do is theater or what I really want to do is make music or paint or walk puppies for a living, whatever it is. If someone, you know, let's say in their 40s or 50s or even 60s, doesn't matter. If someone older goes, this is what I want. This, I'm finally realizing this is my dream and this is what I want to go for. What advice would you give someone like that? I think that um, like a huge asset that anyone has that has just lived on the earth for longer is just having more connections, especially to um, kinds of people that do all different things. And so um, I think a huge asset that people, um, you know, who are any age, but especially older people can bring is who are the people that you know, who love theater, who are not actually professionally working on it. Um, and how did those people, how are they able to kind of help the things that you said, you know, like creating those new shows or new projects? And, um, you know, so much of being a producer is finding the audience members and the investors and all of that. So with any creative endeavor, um, you know, figuring out how to use your network to make it happen is a huge part of it. Um, <clears throat> and that can mean like, oh, I, I have a friend who's a lawyer and they can help me create a contract for a new project I want to do. Or here are the kinds of people I can draw on for marketing to create my audience. So um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a huge asset that people who are older have. But I also think that just the knowledge that you have as you get older about what you want to do is, you know, so informative. And, um, you know, you've covered a lot of it. I think just being able to know what you're passionate about is like step one. And, and it's amazing to me to watch people do that. I see, I'm seeing people doing it right now that, oh, I'm, this is what I'm really passionate about. I'm going to go, I'm going to go see what the possibilities are, even though six months ago, four months ago, they would have never thought to do that. So I think it's so, I think we're headed for an interesting cultural uh, evolution. I won't say revolution, but I think it's going to be a cultural evolution. And it's interesting to me that you said about finding other people what we started this whole conversation with was, you know, what does a producer do? And I think that some people were informed a little bit 
when the TV show Smash was on because, (laughs) you know, because Angelica Houston's character, that's what she was doing. She was producing. And, And it was interesting to watch her sort of have, you know, she had these closed door meetings with investors and she had to be part of the rehearsal process and she had to look at the bottom line and the dotted line of everything. How close was what they showed in the in the in the TV show to what you do as a producer? Um, you know, I love Smash so much, and anyone who follows me on social media knows that I loved it while it was happening. I love it now. Um, I was such a huge fan of it, and I think it was so essential to bringing new people into you know what Broadway does. But one thing I always thought was interesting was like the theater community had this huge need for um, the show to be accurate and like a documentary and I found it funny because you know my dad is a doctor and my dad loves scrubs but when he watches scrubs he doesn't expect it to like teach people how to do heart surgery you know (laughs) it was this thing where you know people would be like that's not what that actor would do in that moment of a rehearsal and I would be like it's a television show (laughs) it's so it it made me so like interested and also frustrated that it, it you know it that that existed but I understand why it did because people want their art form to be represented correctly and they also are interested like you said in knowing like is that actually what a producer does is that actually what a workshop's like and the answer is like yes like the show did show a lot of accurate things but it dramatized them um to create a fictional story so certainly like it wasn't Um, you know, the way that you would understand what a producer does if you were reading a book or watching a documentary. But the idea is that hopefully Smash opens a door so that someone who enjoys it does read a book or watch a documentary and that adds to, you know, their knowledge. And, and that right there is the, is the perfect answer. It's like, yeah, it's, it's fictionalized (laughs) and it's not, it's not necessarily uh, the most accurate representation, but maybe it opens the door for someone to get curious and go, who, let me see what it might actually be like. Cause they weren't, you know, it, it's kind of like looking at Glee. Glee similarly was not trying to show you that in three days, this choir who none of whom could <laughs> actually read music could come up with perfect choreography, perfect four or five part arrangements of this song that they just started learning, which I, whenever I watched Glee, I would always cringe at that because what ended up happening was that a lot of people who came to me for voice lessons ended up thinking that that's how they could learn the songs that they were trying to learn. And I was like, it's, these are these people are all really their musical geniuses the fact that they can do this in three days you know it's just not possible so so this idea in smash of some of this is is exactly what you do and some of it is not at all and it's to tell a story and that's what glee was like to me is they were ultimately telling a story but if if they were real people they'd all be musical geniuses because they could do this incredible choreography and incredible singing and incredible arrangements in 45 minutes. It just, you know, realistically it doesn't happen, but it makes for good television. So when when you watch Smash, when you were looking at Bombshell or uh, Hit List, Hit List was the name of the other show, in looking at them as potential Broadway shows, what would you do to bring them to fruition if you were the producer if you were angelica houston's character if you were doing it what would you do to bring them to put them up you know um well first of all it's i did produce hit list which was like one of the first things i did at 54 below so we had that hands-on experience um, Woohoo! that's great i didn't know that yeah, I worked with um, Josh Safran, who was the showrunner of season two of Smash, um, and with one of the writers of Smash, Julia Brownell, and we put together an actual musical stage version of it um, with Chris Rodriguez and Jeremy Jordan and Andy Mientis um, and a you know fantastic team. And it happened right after Smash ended, and we put it on stage. But the fact is that um, you know if those if those fictional musicals are doing what they're supposed to within another story, then they don't actually have the pieces built to be an actual musical because you know picture if you were telling the story of Smash, like, a, you know, telling the fictional story of how a musical got made and using Hamilton, it wouldn't be satisfying because you would want to actually understand what was going on in a way that you couldn't because that material does not get, you can't just like pluck it in. So, so much of the time when fictional musicals are put into, you know, behind the scenes movies or TV shows, they actually have to function in a different way than an actual musical would. So um, if you want to put them on stage, you really have to create from the, you know, from scratch an actual 
whole show. Um, there's actually a book that um, it's, I think it's called uh, When Broadway Went Hollywood that's really about this and how uh, when backstage movie musicals started being successful was when they started realizing that you really couldn't have a show within a show be a book musical. It had to be a review so that you weren't following two plots at the same time. Um, there's something so interesting in that to me because yeah, I mean, to put Bob Scheller hit list on stage, you have to basically start from scratch and go, okay, we have some of the songs um, and they function in a different way in Smash and we have to turn them into a real musical. And I, I didn't, uh, I may have read that, that you put hit list on, but I didn't recall reading that. So that's so cool that you did that. And, and this idea, what you just said about telling a story within a story and how two plot lines are hard for people to follow. What's different? Is it that you just removed the entire sort of televised plot for hit list and then just told the story of hit list when you put it up at 54 below? Is that what ha How did, how did that work? What, what was the flow of that? Yeah, well, in order to, you know, as mentioned, like kind of do it during Smash, like the reason that Bombshells about Marilyn Monroe is because people are supposed to have this base idea of like, okay, we know who she was. We have all of these understandings of different elements of her personality or her life that um, get us into those moments in the show so that what we're focusing on is the, you know, 60 characters creating Bombshell and we're not going, who's Marilyn Monroe? You know, it's that. Right. And so What's interesting about Hit List is that it used archetypes of, you know, characters in the stuff that we saw in season two of Smash. Um, and what we did was take the bones of story that were created um, for Hit List that made it kind of make sense within Smash and expand on that um, to put an actual script to it. So we used the songs, which, you know, as Joe Iconis, who I collaborate with all the time, uh, wrote Broadway Here I Come and the Goodbye Song, which were in Hit List, and then Pascal and Paul, um, Andrew McMahon, there were all of these writers um, who had songs in Hit List that we took and then crafted into an actual stage story. Wow. That, oh, I'm sorry. Is there video of this? I would have loved to have seen it. I didn't know about it, but then I wasn't in New York. Yeah. Yet, so. Oh my gosh. It was, well, that's the thing. It was so many years ago um, at this point. It's interesting, but yeah, no, it's all online. Actually, we put it online. We were able to put a lot of the video clips of songs on, but during quarantine, we were able to put the whole thing online. So it should be up now. Oh, where is it? Please tell me the, I'll put that in the show notes because that would yeah. be amazing. It on YouTube, I think you can you can really find it by just searching Hit List from Smash. Um, oh, or that's terrific. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll put that for sure in the show notes because the songs on that, the songs on Hit List, don't get me wrong, I, I love the songs on Bombshell, but there was something much more, um, this sounds a little odd, vibrant, I guess, for this, uh, in the songs on Hit List, and that's, it, they drew me like crazy. And Krista Rodriguez's big song, when she's hanging from the... <laughs> yeah. from the you know, I don't at the moment record, recall the name of the song, but I love that song that was on in 2014. That was on repeat on, <laughs> on my iPod. Um, I love, 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 love that song. So uh, let, let me, I know, just a couple more questions. I keep saying that. So if you, if you were going to think about what, what is the, the best thing about getting to produce a show? What is the best thing? I think because, you know, I love theater so much and I love this performer or this writer or this song, just the ability to share that with other people by making it happen. Um, you know, I obviously, Jonathan Larson has been so influential to me and the original company of Rent and all of that. And, you know, I just think about at 54 Below getting to program, uh, you know, Adam Pascal and Anthony Rapp on stage together, reunited, singing from Rent and wow. seeing an audience of, you know, people every night having that experience um, and giving them something that if they were like me and loved Rent and got to see it, or if they're, you know, loved it and didn't get to see it, like creating a live performance that shares what you love. Um, and sometimes that means like introducing a writer to a performer. And sometimes it means reuniting people and that already know each other or creating something new on stage. Um, but whatever it is, it's just being able to like have an audience experience what you love and have them walk away with like joy from experiencing it. it I think that's what hits me. Oh, that's lovely. What a, what a beautiful and all encompassing answer. And so now let's, let's take a look at the other side of that coin. What's the most challenging thing about this work? You know, I, reading a lot of the books I've been, um, makes me just think about how universal this is, but it's like the reason why musicals can become so volatile behind the scenes is that they're so specific in that most shows, you know, and I'm saying musicals a lot, but I really mean plays and anything you see on stage, I just work on musicals more. Um, it's, you know, almost every show you see is the result of like years and years of work from so many different people with different, um, visions, even if they're working in the same room, you know, nobody is the same person. 
And so you have um, with theater, you know, here's this rehearsal we have and it's taking place at 11 p.m. at night and the decision we make now can affect whether this show gets a good review and whether it is something that people remember 10 years from now or 50 years from now or not. And so the pressure on an initial production of a show is so gigantic and there's no editing after, you know, it's not um, something that you can create and then work on later. Whatever you present live um, to an audience is the thing that exists. So um, there's just such pressure with so many different elements and such a, um, you know, pressure cooker of time and space with theater um, that I think is always a challenge and it's what makes theater so electric and so compelling for people and it also is like endlessly um, difficult too. And, you know it's funny that you said that it's compelling it's electric and it's difficult and I think there's I think there's a saying something like nothing good comes easy but but there's there's there is something to me about the difficulty of of as an actor, as a performer of pushing yourself to really dig, dig deep and find, find the raw points of, of your character. And I wonder, as a producer, do you do the same thing? Is there some part of you that's digging deep to find that, that, that pinpoint, that most poignant moment within the show? Like you said earlier, it was about shows that are about real people really strike you and so so are you doing that when you're when you're producing a show are you looking for that and if so what happens when you find it yeah um you know that makes me think about something that I, I've been like ruminating on recently which is like in history, I think a lot of them, and there's exceptions to this, like with anything, but with a lot of the most successful landmark musicals of, you know, all time, like the Chorus Lines, the Hamiltons, the Oklahomas, like shows we've been talking about, um, they're the result of like clashing uh, collaboration collaborators and also like risky elements. And that's the exact same thing that some of the shows that are like technically the biggest not successes are also comprised of the Merrily We Roll Alongs, like the shows that close quickly. Um, it takes such huge risks to create shows that are both of those things and the shows that um you know basically are comprised of like not risky elements and not um you know very very disparate teams create the stuff in the middle um and so i think that um you know not to say that shows that run a short period of time aren't as worthy, but it's just that I think that they have a lot more in common with the biggest hits than the shows in the middle do. Um, and it, that's just something interesting about theater to me. And as a producer, you're thinking about like, what are the ways we can challenge an audience and challenge ourselves to create something new? And that may, you know, make something nosedive and that might create something that like bursts open the art form. But if you take the not risky option, like chances are you're only gonna end up in the middle. So I think that's something that is fascinating about theater that I don't think is really true of many other industries. That's so fascinating that you said that. And, and yet here's, here's something that's compelling to me right now, as you said it, for you, it sounds like they're the, the, the ones that didn't have the long, the long runs, the, the, the ones that close quickly, that's something it sounds like you want to shine a light on as well, specifically. I mean, you, you've produced shows about that. So, so, is it that is it that is it that grain of greatness that makes you go they took risks and this is what i want to highlight i want to highlight what is what is spectacular about this show that closed within 2 weeks or had you know two nights or whatever what is it that makes you go these these are the ones i want to highlight what about the show and what about the writers makes you want to do that um, 100%. You know, it's a lot of what you said that you look at something that might not have had like a huge life or a huge audience at a certain point and go, oh, there are so many people who would love, um, you know, this character or this song or this, you know, risk that they took in a way that um, I think they would appreciate if they got to be presented with it. But a huge part of it also to me has always been that, um, you know, I don't think that there are bad pieces of art. I think there's art that you like and art that someone else is going to like. And, mm -hmm. you know, there are plenty of shows that are not my thing but that I can go, oh, that person would love that. Or, you know, it's art is personal in that way. And so, um, you know, there are so many shows that I think are hits that I don't like or flops that I do like and vice versa. It's, it's just really a matter of personal taste. And I think that art is stronger when people can have that for themselves and cannot associate like good things run a long time, bad things don't. And it's so much more complicated. And so I think that like spreading that is a big part of why I want to shine a light on it. So someone goes, Oh, you know, right now, as we chat, I'm staring at a poster for the goodbye girl, which is, you know, oh. definitely not 
Love that show. And I know so many people that love that show and they have to be given the opportunity to discover it in order to love it. And maybe some people hate that show and that's fine too. Um, and maybe some people hate, you know, Cats, which ran for a very long time or love it. And it's just that the length of run of a show is not what dictates its worth. Oh, absolutely. And it's so interesting that you said goodbye. That's, I love that show. Uh, so with, with shows like The Goodbye Girl, when they are very specifically, again, about real people, what, what makes them, what makes them special to you? What makes them, what makes that, what makes you go that, that show? What is it about the, the, the shows about real people that makes you do that? Because you said that earlier and you said it shows that are about real people really thrill me. So what is it? What is it about them that makes you go this, this is what I want? I think that, um, and you mentioned Wicked, which is so interesting because I do love Wicked. It's definitely like an exception to my like, this should have really happened rule. Um, and I think that's because the characters are grounded in such, um, you know, real emotions and real, uh, you know, connections with each other. But, um, you know, I think it's that for me as someone who loves musical theater writers so much, being able to really glimpse someone um, writing personally and authentically comes across when it's a show about real people in a way that it might not if it isn't. Um, by which I mean like, you know, when we get to see falsettos and see like, you know, those people in sneakers singing about their experience and their lives, I feel like we're seeing Bill Finn at his like most authentic. And mm -hmm. a lot of the times I find that when you're seeing a writer create a musical about like you know and this isn't always true but like superhero heroes fighting a zombie apocalypse or you know a musical based <laughs> on a movie that has nothing to do with their real life and is fantastical like there's just too many steps of remove and I feel like when I see writers creating things about real people there's just a sense of like authenticity that you know and again it's not always true but I think that it it creates something real um that I just like organically respond to I love that. And I love the idea of creating something that, that an audience can organically respond to. There are so many shows that, that other people hate that I'm like, Oh, I love this show. So, so, <laughs> and, and, and I think part of it is that there, that there's, that there's somebody that I really, one character maybe, or one song that I really, that really speaks to me that I really relate to. And that will, that will make me a loyal fan for life. And it's, it's that idea of bringing that in and, and, putting productions up like that, that, that will give people more exposure to it, which I think is terrific. That, that's so great that you do that kind of work. But I know as a, as a writer, you also have done a ton of interviews. And so a couple last questions, I promise. If you could have any dream interview with one of the greats on Broadway, who would it be and why? You know, I've thought about this a lot because at this point, um, you know, I've interviewed a lot of people who are in the books who sadly passed on. And so getting the opportunity to chat with them and to help them, you know, have their stories live on in some small way has been such a like mind melding part of the experience. And so I've definitely been like, oh, you know, I almost interviewed Mary Rogers, who I love very much and really, you know, worship her work before she passed. And I unfortunately didn't. So it's like, who are who are those people that I wish I had gotten and didn't? And how do I talk to those people now? Because everything is, you know, temporary and transient. Um, and so I don't know who my dream interview is, who I haven't, but who's like still with us. I should think about that. It's a great question. But I definitely have like my list of like, I wish that I could sit at a table with like Mary Rogers and, you know, Michael Bennett and Peter Allen and Bob Fosse and Wendy Wasserstein, like the dream interviews that never were. And that inspires me to think about like who I want to interview now and, and kind of chase those people down. And I think that's a, it's a great idea as you, as you do more untold stories books, there's so, there's so many people who have this sort of institutional knowledge, this historical knowledge that, that it would be so great to get their perspectives and their stories told. And it's, it sounds a little weird, like before they pass, but it's true. It, you know, the more people, the more people who have been there and walk that road that we can hear their stories, the more it, it informs our hearts and our minds forever. And I think that's, there's something so powerful about that. Um, I have just, again, a couple questions. So books, 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 books. I know you're reading tons of books. If you could recommend three books that you think people really ought to read because they love the theater or to spark a love of theater, what would those books be? 
Um, you know, three of my absolute favorite books, and obviously I have a lot, but three of the ones that I recommend most are um, Not Since Carrie, which is by Ken Mandelbaum, and it definitely addresses a lot of what we've been talking about today. Um, Not Since Carrie was like hugely influential to me because it really goes into depth about um, so many musicals that were underappreciated in their time. It talks about shows that played less than 300 performances on Broadway from the 50s through the 90s. But when I say in depth, I also like mean it, it's like juicy, it's fun. You get like fascinating stories about like the people involved, the plots, um, all that happened. And every page you're like, oh my God, what? Oh my God, what? So it's it's just a fun read. And it's also like really informative about musicals as an art form while looking at the ones that didn't run for very long. Mm -hmm. um, and then. Everything Was Possible, The Birth of the Musical Follies by Ted Chapin is a huge one for me as well. Um, Ted is like, you know, a theatrical great in our industry, but when he was like about 20 years old, he was basically an intern on the original production of Follies and he kept diaries about it that he then turned into a book many years later. Um, wow. And it's a fascinating, you know, look inside a theatrical process of a musical that ended up being really, you know, important. Um, and then the third one is much more rarely heard of, and that's a book called Underfoot in Show Business by Helene Hanf. Um, and that book uh, really rocked my world because basically Helene Hanf, who, um, you know, was a very successful playwright and writer later in life, wrote a memoir by a theater kid who wasn't famous, but she did this in the 40s. So basically you're reading about, um, you know, like so many aspiring theater people now or you know theater professionals that were once that way you're seeing that from the perspective of someone who like stamped all the exclamation points on the program for Oklahoma while she was working in the press office wow. um and it's just such an amazing fun and fascinating book about like coming up in the theater but in a different era oh that sounds amazing all three of those I'm gonna put them right on my library list right now as soon as we get off this chat uh, so then for you for, for you, how do people find you? Where can people go and find Jennifer Ashley Tepper? Because I know you're gonna have tons of new fans after this. Where do people find you? How do they, how do they get a hold of you? I um, I'm on both Twitter and Instagram at Jen Ash Tep. Um, and yeah, I mean, I have loved the way that both like Twitter and Instagram have allowed me to like spread uh, Broadway history and present love in the community and like how so many other people are doing that too. So at Jen Ash Tep, that's where I'm at. Perfect. And do you have a website? Yeah, JenniferAshleyTepper.com. Okay, because I'm going to put both of those on the show notes so that people can see your work and get get to know what you're doing better and to and to learn more about the history of theater which i think is fabulous and uh one last question uh if if you had a plane a sky rating plane and it could write something that the entire world would see what would you say you know, I feel like so many of us right now, my first instinct to respond to that was that it should say wear a mask. <laughs> <laughs> Very specific to the time that we're living in. But um, yeah, you know, there's no theater and there's no arts without people and without people being healthy. And so right now, like that has to be our focus. So I think that would be my answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. What would your answer be? My answer would probably be be kind. That would probably be my, my answer. Very good answer too. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, it's funny. You, out of all the interviews I've done, and that's the last question I ask for everybody I do an interview with, and no one's ever asked me what my answer would be. <laughs> so thank you for asking that. But yeah, it probably would be, be kind. That would be the, um, that would be the, yeah, yeah. I mean, I could go the whole follow your dreams, but I think honestly, kindness is, uh, kindness is paramount. So, so, Jennifer, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me. Is there anything else that you think people ought to know? Is there any last bit of wisdom that you'd like to, before we sign off, is there anything else? No, you know, we've covered such a wide variety of things. I thank you so much for having me. Like this was such a fantastic chat. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad. Yeah. I'm, I'm really, I'm delighted that you were able to, to, take time to do this because this is some, I mean, theater is so close to my heart. I used to, I actually was, when I first gra I graduated from the University of Michigan, when I first graduated, I was all set to move to New York. I was going to, I was going to work to be in the theater. And then 
money ran out and I lost my apartment and I lost my job, like both in the same day before I even moved here and, <laughs> and ended up in DC, uh, living on a friend's floor. So, so theater is really, really close to my heart. So it's so wonderful to get this beautiful perspective and you bring, you bring such joy and effervescence to, to the theater, to your love for, for today, but also theater a hundred years ago. And I, and I'm really grateful that you're doing the work you're doing to help people learn, to help people get curious, to help people go and appreciate and, and participate and, and love musical theater and theater in general, as much as, as, as you do, as I do. So I want to thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for honestly being so wonderful at like understanding the creative process, being that, you know, you're a creator yourself. I feel like this chat was like, it percolated my brain about so many different topics. Oh, yay. I'm so glad. Yeah, it's, this is so much, this is a labor of love for me. And it's because I want to highlight the work creatives are doing, but also I want to inspire people who might be afraid to, 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 to become creative or to explore their creativity to, to try it, you know, to open that part of themselves. Because I think that to me, creativity is going to save the world. That's thinking creatively, thinking collaboratively, working together, doing creative things is going to, is going to save us. So that's, that's, that's my goal anyway. So I want to thank you once again, Jennifer, I really appreciate you being here and this has been and will continue to be the Creative Mindset Podcast. My name is Isolde Trachtenberg, and I'm super glad that you've been listening. I mean, how could you not have been? Jennifer's amazing. Find her, follow her. You're going to learn so much more about theater and the history of theater and beautiful, amazing projects. She's, she's a mover and a shaper, and I'm very excited that she is here and doing this work. So until next time, if you like what you've heard, please consider leaving a review for the show, getting in touch and letting me know if there's something more or something different that you'd like to be hearing about because there I, I work with creative. I am an equal opportunity creative interviewer. So if you have other people that you'd like me to, to talk to, let me know who they are because I think it would be great to have these conversations out there so that we can all learn and be nourished by them. Until next time, once again, this is Isolde Trachtenberg and I send you all of my love. Thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Today's episode was produced by Zolda Trachtenberg and is copyright 2020. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, this is Zolda Trachtenberg and I send you all of my love.